Um, but thank you guys for coming here. It's obviously a beautiful day. We're competing with a lot of uh, other sessions as well as the beautiful sun. And this is the post-lunch death session at every conference. Um, so I'm particularly excited about this group. We were just talking before this session a little bit about what we wanted to get out of this. And those of you here this morning, you heard me say that I really think at this point in both impact investing generally and social impact bonds specifically, um, there's a lot of hypers, there's a lot of haters in social impact bonds. Uh, and there are a few doers, and we really can learn from the doers more from anyone else at this point. And so not only do we get to lead, I mean, do we get to learn by doing from this panel, but what's really exciting is we are going to get to learn while doing, because this deal hasn't even closed. And so there's a real spirit on this panel to share, while this thing is happening, what is going on, what does it take to make it work, where are the challenges, why is it worth going through the hassles? So. If you guys came to this panel to hear about how social impact bonds are going to change the world, be the most exciting and obviously breakthrough thing in the world, um, this probably is not the right panel for you. Uh, if you want to really be here to learn about what it's really going to take to realize the potential of something that is still very much in an experimental phase, um, I couldn't imagine you'd be with a better group here. And so what we have on the panel is um, the constellation of a deal. And we'll talk a little bit about the specific deal that is about to happen or in the middle of happening. Uh, in India, and on the stage we have the investors, the people who will pay the investors if the deal works, the people who are going to be implementing the deal, uh, as well as the people putting it together. So it's very much a live example, reasoning, learning from one specific story uh, about what is happening with the potential of social impact bonds in their application to development. So before I get started, and I won't talk much, but just want to describe a little bit about the situation we're dealing with. Uh, many of you know that in many countries, and India included, um, we know the payoffs in the short and long term to education. And specifically, the education of girls has huge payoffs to society in multiple ways, not only to the lives that they can lead, both of enrichment and empowerment, but also to the multiple effects that has in the long term ability of that society to succeed. Um, there's been a huge improvement in those outcomes in India, but there's still a long way to go, especially in specific geographies. Uh, so in the state of Rajasthan, uh, Safina in the middle uh, leads an amazing nonprofit organization that is actively putting many children into schools who otherwise would be completely out of the school system, and not only getting them there, but once they are there, helping them to succeed, learn what they need to learn to make something of that education. So. <coughs> That's the starting point, and what we're going to explore today is why, for her team and for the people around this, around her, and we put her in the middle for a reason, <laughs> a social impact bond is, going, is being put together to enable her to increase the work she's doing, ultimately to improve both the short-term outcomes of those girls and other children in the community's chances of being educated for all those long-term benefits. So, I'm going to start, we're not going to necessarily introduce people one by one, but we're going to really try to have an interactive conversation. And the starting point, and again, it's why Safina is in the middle, is a question of, so as someone who leads a nonprofit, mm -hmm. has a very clear and compelling way to improve, to, to achieve your mission, um, why is a social impact bond something that you're exploring? And we'll get into the details of the bond as, as the story unfolds. But so the why? development impact bond. Sorry, the development impact bond, yeah. Yeah. So why is this something that for you doing, why didn't you just keep doing what nonprofits do, which is raise money from grant makers, yeah. and then go to government and try and get paid as much as you could? Um, so, you know, we started with this particular piece about two and a half years ago. So as a nonprofit, we've really been struggling to get this particular idea off the ground, and so call us mad. Um, but it first started with DFID. DFID put out this girl education challenge, and they said, part of this three or four million dollar grant, we could do it as a payment by results. This is the first time we'd ever even, I had ever even heard about it. But the idea really, really, really somewhat appealed to me. Because at the end of the day, India has one of the worst indicators for gender, right? You talk about violence, you talk about education, you talk about child marriage, anything. India's almost like, you know, in absolute numbers, probably at the bottom. Um, on the other side, we have 2.4 million NGOs in the country. You have the government investment and stuff, but you also have 2.4 million NGOs. But where is the impact? We have an NGO for every 400 people. And so this idea to me was, was how do you, as somebody who's committed to creating and changing lives of girls, how can you tie funding to pure impact or to outcomes? Um, and the idea was 
and we discussed it within the team and everybody felt really passionate about at least trying it. Um, and so then we invested about two years developing the proposal, developing the ideas, and then finally this June, uh, we got the investor outcome pair and everybody kind of together. So can you in one or two sentences yeah. just describe what are you setting out to achieve, mm -hmm. and what are the outcomes, and what will it take for you? So how's the money working in this? What do you mean, how's the money so working? So, where, so how much money are you raising, and what outcomes do you seek to specifically achieve with that money? So kind, the kind of out, so again, in this particular deal, we're not, we haven't signed off on the exact things and the payment triggers and stuff. But for, for us as a service provider, as people on the ground, what we want to see essentially is that girls who are out of school should be in school, they should stay in school, and they should obviously be learning. Right? Those are the outcomes as far as, as we're concerned. Now, we um, are grant-funded, about 98% of it grant-funded. This will probably make 2% of our funding, but we're hoping that this is what is really going to show us how you can, you can tie the money to the outcomes, how you can fund future scale, um, and that's what mm -hmm. we hope it'll do. Great. So we're going to turn over to um, Faith on the corner. So Faith is with a London-based foundation called the Children's Investment Fund Foundation. You guys have a lot of grant money. You give grants to organizations like Safina's all the time, and one of your focuses, hence the name, is children. <laughs> Why would you, as a philanthropy, not simply give her grant money and say, we're going to give you a grant to increase your program and put your program into more schools? <clears throat> We've heard from Safina that she is motivated not just to see the program reach more students, but to ultimately be accountable to more of those students actually staying in school and learning. So why do you as a funder not just make this easy on yourself and just give her a grant? Why do this development impact bond? Uh, that's a great question. I think <laughs> one we're continuously asking ourselves. <laughs> um, I think we don't know yet, to be honest. I, I think we're not sure. Uh, for us, this was, uh, you know, when the Optimist Foundation approached us with this opportunity uh, a few months ago, it was an, a chance for us to put a dip our toe in uh, to something that we've been thinking about and talking about for a long time. SIF has been, uh, the Children's Investment Fund Foundation, has been looking at a range of results-based financing op options, and, and the Development Impact Bond is just one of them. Um, and to be totally honest, we would invest in Educate Girls and, as, as a direct grant. They're a great buy. We're very happy to be <laughs> being part of this. Um, what we're trying to achieve in this particular instance is a, a proof of concept. We're really interested. If there's a more efficient, better way to spend money, we are all about finding that out. And part of the privilege of being a philanthropy with a lot of flexibility uh, and no taxpayers payers to be accountable to is that we can spend a whole bunch of cash up front to find out what works. And so that's really what we're buying in this instance is not only great outcomes for girls in India, but we're also buying you know, what we hope to be a proof of concept product that can be taken out um, and, and uh, replicated and scaled, um, and at a minimum, we would love to know, you know, what are the what are the missing pieces? What is more data? How do we add information to the market? Um, and so we've also really invested. We're, we are investing in a process evaluator. We have a board of advisors who are just really giving us a lot of feedback as much as possible. So, yeah, that that's that's what we're about right now. So, so just to be clear, so Safina's group, Educate Girls, is going to extend this program, bring more children into schools or otherwise out of schools, evaluate whether they are actually learning, and if they are, and if enough of them come into those schools, then the Children's Investment Fund Foundation will pay for those results. In the meantime, Safina needs money to run the program, and so an investor has to start this process by investing the money in the organization, and if this works, and if the evaluator determines that they made the outcomes they had sought out to achieve, then the Children's Investment Fund will pay back the investor who has given the money to Safina. So that's how it's basically going to work. And to my left is Faye, who represents the organization that has made this investment, which is the UBS Optimist Foundation. And again, the same question to you. As a foundation working with a bank, you easily could have just handed a grant to this organization. I'm sure you give grants to many similar organizations. Why invest instead? in this structure? Yeah, uh, so a couple points of background. Um, one is that the UBS, the bank, um, has the largest, is the largest wealth manager in the world. 
So the bank has a lot of money under management. That's sort of one piece of background. A second piece of background is that the UBS Optimist Foundation, which is the corporate uh, foundation, is a kind of an unusual foundation. So I, I happen to be on the board of the foundation. I'm not on staff of this foundation. Um, and it is a strategic foundation that gives in three areas, education, health, and children's protection. And what we try to do is uh, bring in the assets of our high net worth clients and deploy them philanthropically uh, uh, in our strategic philanthropy. So that's what we typically do. It's an unusual model for a corporate foundation. Uh, it's very, uh, lots of diligence, very serious, very results oriented. So we could do that. Um, but what attracts us uh, uh, to this development impact bond is just exactly what Faith was saying, that there's an opportunity here, makes sense for a bank, who has a lot of money, to play the investor role so that we can ultimately see if this is an instrument that will work for bringing more money to solutions for people who are in the bottom of the pyramid, we want to be involved in that. Um, and, and if it works, uh, and if uh, we can actually prove out this proof of concept to close to being what we think it can be, then we think there's an opportunity to create a kind of ongoing instrument for our high net worth clients to invest in that we can help manage. Yeah, that's great. So I want to come back later and ask you, Faith, um, why a foundation would be willing to pay investors <laughs> in return. Uh, we'll get to that question later. But in the meantime, I just want to turn to Michael, um, Eddie. So uh, Michael is one of a handful of people around the world who have put out their shingle as social impact bond intermediaries. Uh, what him and his organization do is help connect investors, payers, and great organizations like uh, Educate Girls to put these deals together. Um, I guess I'll ask you, why is this something you've decided to pursue professionally, generally, and then what, is it, what has it taken to get this deal as far as it's been? Not just the good news, but some of the challenges as well. Well, that's a great question. Um, on your first question, uh, why, why are we committed and why do we think that social impact bonds can actually be adapted into development, actually actually stand potentially to serve a much greater use in development? First, I actually, my background comes from reverse impact evaluation, an organization called Poverty Action Lab based out of the MIT, which does all sorts of, builds scientific evidence about what works and what doesn't in development using rigorous randomized control trials. Over the past 10 years, we've seen an explosion of rigorous evidence about what works and what doesn't. On the Poverty Action Lab website, over 400 studies about what are most effective programs, programs like Safina's as well as others, um, and also what, what can we learn from other programs. What we haven't seen, though, is that translation of evidence into policy. And ultimately, rigorous randomized control trials, they're great, but they're not an end in themselves. And there needs to be that translation into policy. So we see social impact bonds and development impact bonds as a fast track, as an accelerator to, to scale up evidence-based programs like Safina's. Um, of those four, over 400 programs on uh, JPAL's website, only six have reached, have reached scale. And that's on the, on the Poverty Actions Lab website. Right? That means that there's a tremendous potential. There's this gap between what we know works and what we actually do. Our goal with social impact bonds and development impact bonds is to close that gap and to ultimately bring more organizations like Safina to a greater scale to impact more girls um, as well as other, other social outcomes um, and change the way that social problems in developing countries are tackled. Okay, so that was as clear a description of why this is so exciting as I've heard. <laughs> so now you get to the reality. Yes. <laughs> Wouldn't that be amazing? We yes. got 394 things that work that aren't getting funded. We have this instrument to make it happen. So tell us about what you've learned about how hard it is to do it in the context right. of this particular deal, because you gotta right. start somewhere. Absolutely, and we started, as <laughs> Safina mentioned, with, with Educate Girls over two years ago, and it's been a long journey, and there's been a lot to learn. We actually started working directly with governments, and we found that it's working with governments, particularly without a proof of concept yet, is very, very challenging. And so we realized that we actually need some first movers. We need some champions who have the flexibility, who have the ability to, 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 to take risks in how they're financing programs, um, to be able to develop a proof of concept to show to governments and to show to development uh, finance institutions how this could work and to actually start generating some lessons. What we found in SIF is, is a tremendous partner who's willing to take that risk, willing to hold on to their cash until they actually observe uh, results and pay based on those results. Um, when we get into the nitty and gritty, we actually find, I mean, once we've actually brought everyone to the table, that's, that's the first challenge, right? 
now that we've got everyone at the table, we've actually started to start designing these contracts. And while social impact bonds and development impact bonds are new, it's important to recognize that they're not, um, they build on a long history of results-based financing instruments, right? And so the, what, what this long history of results-based financing instruments has shown us is that um, paying for results can unlock tremendous potential uh, in implementing partners, but also if you do it the wrong way, you can actually create all sorts of perverse incentives, adverse consequences. You could, there's a lot of ways that you can screw it up. So, so it's really important to be diligent about how we're measuring Educate Girls' uh, uh, impacts. Make sure we're measuring in a robust way. We're measuring the right things, and we're providing Educate Girls with the right incentives to be able to have them focus on the impact that they really want to achieve. And that's a non-trivial task. Yeah. That's great. So I want to get into, again, later on, just what is it going to take for this to succeed in a way that doesn't just meet short-term expectations, but really sets up your organization to be successful and to grow it. But you also said something, Michael, that I want to turn to Drew on, and that is the goal for everyone on, the, on this stage isn't just to have this one deal work. And I don't want to belittle it and say little deal because it's a huge deal to get it done. But in different ways, you've all said, we are doing this because we believe it has had potential to create a new path that each of your institutions could follow. Um, but to your point, when you're talking about development, a major source of capital and development is going to come from the development finance institutions, whether that's the grant-based ones, the World Bank, or the IMF, and the bilaterals and others. So Drew, who works in uh, the World Bank, in the development marketplace, you are the person this group is going to turn to <laughs> and say, hey, this, this pilot worked. Now you guys should be <laughs> pumping billions of dollars into these approaches. What is it going to take to convince your colleagues? Um, <laughs> what's it going to take for the, this or, or the other pilots that people in this room are probably working on to actually start to change how major flows of, of capital work in the development system? So first I just want to frame one thing about the SIB and the DIB just to, because I think that's very relevant about where an organization like the World Bank thinks about it. And I'll just use one simple definition of differences, and there are a couple of other variations to it. But by the terminology, the development impact bond is relying on development agencies or donors or funders to be the payer of record once the accomplishments happen. Where in most of the discussions on social impact bonds to date have been the British government in the first one, uh, the state of Massachusetts for the one here in the U.S., and so on. It's always been a government agency. So what's an interesting thing here now, what's happening with the development impact bond, is governments, local governments, are being left aside for a moment. They are not the principal payer. Um, and I think all of us would agree that long term, there's a lot of dollars in government um, and, and a lot of reasons why government should be involved in this. And so seem to be the first one to say, I'd love to have the state of Rajasthan behind <laughs> <Pay> this. <for. laughs> but there's a big but is this issue of getting governments ahead of, ahead of this. And it's harder in the developing economies for multiple different reasons. One, they don't have the cash that the government of the British government might have. They don't have the other un underlying assumption that there's going to be cost savings. They're not even spending money on the stuff that Safina is doing because all of her programs to date have been grant funded without any material government support. I think you said, what, 98% of your money is grant money in terms of your capital structure today. So, so the question then, as, as Anthony is framing it, is how do you get both development agencies and then ultimately governments involved? Because development agencies really are just an extension of working with, with governments. And really, you know, putting in perspective, the World Bank, we do $30 billion a year, but our $30 billion goes to governments. And so then the question is, can we get governments behind this to use the money effectively? Um, and we'll come back to Michael's point, which is it's totally logical. It makes sense that they should do it. But to, to really answer Anthony's question um, and why this panel is so interesting is there's still, it's in a theoretical and an educational or academic discussion today for most people. Even though the Petersburg has been done and there's been now 20 odd done around the globe, there's still not a formulaic answer to here it is. This is how it gets done very easily. So I think one of the first thing is going to be, you can list a couple of things. There's going to have to be a process that people understand. Governments are just not good at, at being told, you know, it's vague and don't worry about it. Just jump in and <laughs> it'll all work fine. Um, it's just not where they start. Same thing with development agencies. They do need to see a process. The other one is the alignment of the outcomes to the Millennium Goals or any type of other metric that the agencies are using as their own benchmarks for this or the local governments. The third is a vision that the local government will get involved. I think it's going to become one of the most critical things over time. And, and I know that's, again, your desire in all of this is to really see the state of Rajasthan and other states really get behind it. But they're going to have to see that vision happen. And really, it's going to, 
need these other things. The process you can explain to people, you can show that it's actually achieving out outcomes that people want, and that there is then also, then there's the cynical side of this, which is what's in it for those impact investors? Why are they doing it? Does this align with the government goals? And that clarity has to happen and see that actually there can be an alignment. And that, of course, is that broader discussion about impact investing in general and does it align with social outcomes and, and government-mandated social outcomes. So yeah. these things have to just kind of come together right. and then we can see it really taking off in the few dollars that we have available to put into it. just picking up on your last point, I, I think so much of what we are all about in this room is a fundamental belief that there are new ways for us to reorganize how we work, that because you're in a nonprofit, doesn't mean you shouldn't be sitting down with a banker, and because you're a banker, doesn't mean you shouldn't be sitting down with a foundation, and it does require us, not just your work, but impact investing generally, to enable people who are unused to working together to work together in new ways. Um, and frankly, if the old ways of working worked, it wouldn't be worth the headache. Um, but you know, there's a real sense here, and I think in the audience and around this room, that we can do better. Um, but along the way, you have to figure out ways to work together. You have to get your lawyers uh, to write documents. Foundation lawyers are not used to sitting down and writing term sheets with bankers um, and so forth. So just a question to anyone on the panel, how has this experience forced you to work in different ways with someone in this sort of system, either you individually or your institution, and what's been the challenges, whether either for yourself or for your peers? Um, and again, have there been any, any positive surprises? So... Uh, I, I'm going to answer your question but somewhat indirectly. I was thinking the other thing to add to Drew's point is that, and this is something that we're really trying to capture, is that, and it's, it's oft discussed in the SIB context and definitely in the in development impact bond context, is that the, what, what are the real transaction costs of doing this? And that's also going to matter in the longer term for a developing government down the line. Why is this worth it, not just waiting to get some World Bank money and, you know, do whatever they want to do with it? You know, why would they do this versus something else, right? And... And so one of the things that I think has been, and you know, you're right, this has been way more work than I had ever imagined. <laughs> when, you, when we, you know, when we sat down with uh, Optimus and Insiglio and Safina a few months ago, I was like, oh, this is a done deal, man. This is going to be my easiest program. Um, and it has been both... Um, you know, logistically challenging, it is academically challenging, it is organizationally challenging. We're asking our organization, SIF is what we call an engaged funder. That means we monitor very closely all of our programs. Usually I'd be breathing down Safina's neck, um, you know, asking her why isn't that working and how are we going to measure it? And, and to take a step back and say, okay, we're just going to agree to these terms and then I'm going to walk away for three years. That is a huge shift for us um, as a donor. Uh, particularly as a, a philanthropy. And so, but at the end of the day, I think that also offers such a huge opportunity. If we could diversify our portfolio such that, you know, I was managing a couple of big programs more closely like that, and then we had a few million, 10 million, 20 million dollars where we walked away for a couple of years, that is so much more efficient, so much more capital, you know, human capital use. Like, but Right now what we're seeing is that the transaction cost of doing that is really, really high, and someone's going to have to pay for that, and we're happy to do it right now, but I think what we want to learn in the long term is what are the routes to lowering those transaction costs. Um, and there's going to be some set that don't matter the set, that doesn't matter the size of the deal. It could be $250 million, it could be you know, 25000 It's going to be the same thing. And so you know, I think we're going to have to understand what the margins are and when it's worth it and when it's not. Yeah. So, Sophia, the same question to you. you know, I'm sure when you first thought of this idea, you, you run an organization where you want to be focused on outcomes. Yeah. Funders tend to tell you just account outputs. That's frustrating. Mm -hmm. Now there's this way to finally get your funders aligned in the same thing you want to do. I'm sure that idea was most beautiful <laughs> at that moment. <laughs> and then it just got complicated. So how's that been, that experience? And where has, where has the tension and complications come um, from? I have to say, we, there is tension in that. I mean, I think there's just so many people. And a couple of the parties are still not on the table, right? Like the outcome evaluator and stuff. So we're still waiting for other people to join in. So it is very, very, very complicated. I think it is exhausting because it's 2% of your budget, but the amount of work it's taking... But, you know, we have, we've had two years head start, so we've been so committed onto this that what we did last year was we got a little bit of money and we actually started testing, saying, okay, so while the deal is being put together, what does it really look on the ground in terms of implementation? 
Because you're right, right now, funders pay us on our log frame or on your whatever, and they say this is the input or the activity and these are the outputs you're gonna get to, and that's how you're funded. Now, I am currently working in seven and a half thousand schools a million children. I wanna reach four million children, but that's where I am. And it, just think about it. It's carpet bombing a large area <laughs> with that same strategy. Now, in the <coughs> real world, that doesn't necessarily create impact, right? Every school has a different need. Like we know with our children's school, we say toilets are an issue for girls. Toilets, yes, but sometimes you can build a toilet and you can still have girls outside of the school because there's probably something else that's really holding back. Yeah. So what's been really, and this is the positive kind of, it's very challenging, but the positive thing when we actually started to play around with how would you implement this on the ground if this was a real transaction? We realized that you have to give your field staff this results-based approach and you have to give, you train them on everything. So it's like they have this arsenal, they have all the tools, they can, they have, you know, everything that's required to make a chain, but then they become so results focused and they can decide, well, here it is going to be the school, but here it's the politics between, uh, and so you've got this great dynamic stuff happening on the ground, which traditional grants don't allow you to do. They fund you to simply do this carpet bombing. It's this pill, so it's the same pill to every child, to every school, to whatever. And so for us, that's been very, very exciting. And I think for people who work on the ground, they're the bosses, you know, they know, they can recognize, and they don't have to be told because of this grant agreement that this is all you do. So even though it's very complicated and it's very difficult and it's exhausting, when I see that coming up, <laughs> uh, how they can sit down with the community and make their plan and they can do whichever, whichever order, whichever thing, whichever combination of stuff they wanna do. Um, and we've had very, very, very good results. We're getting, actually seeing, much better and much faster improvement in those particular blocks than we do elsewhere. So, so, so that's me, why yeah. I find this completely like, you know. Yeah. So just a similar question to you, because it sounds like what you're describing is a way that a for-profit investor more typically invests. It's invest money into a management team with an investment thesis and trust them to some pretty large degree that they know what to do with the money and will make you money. It's very different than how foundations tend to operate, which is fund someone to do a set of things they agree to do and prevent them from deviating. For you, <laughs> and some, some of you know, Faye is quite a legend in foundation world, and I'm not gonna ask you to put on that hat. Um, as someone representing a bank foundation, has that dynamic, how has that dynamic shifted the conversation among the bankers? Is this something that they are then more able to understand because it's closer to their work? And if so, is that positive? I'm sure there's also some dangerous elements of oversimplification. Well, you asked a lot of questions there. I'm yeah. going to answer one of them. Uh, <laughs> Take your pick. <laughs> uh, which is, I think, one of the surprises, uh, at least to me, um, in, uh, in this process, was that our clients uh, are all staffed. Right? They all have managers who help manage their money. And those professional staffers, the people who manage the family offices and so forth, they're the ones who interact with the bank around how you manage your money. But around their philanthropy, it's the, it's the high net worth and ultra high net worth people themselves. And so what's been really interesting to me uh, in this process is how excited the, the people, the real people behind the money, are um, to get close to these potential deals, to get close to this potential instrument, uh, and to actually see it work in a process and in a way that is familiar and they trust it. Yeah. Uh, and they trust the seriousness and the diligence and the results orientation, and they also really like that it's doing good. Uh, and they want, and, and there, there's all, I think, what we already see some evidence of some, some pent up demand and appetite and, and the potential to really unleash many more resources. And so, uh, you know, you never know. We talked about the skepticism of government, and then you've got the private investors seemingly very enthusiastic um, and trusting a process that they know that they're familiar with, to Drew's point earlier, are there processes uh, that you can, uh, you can enumerate and elaborate? And in the banking world, on the investment side, they are because they're so familiar. Yeah. So how do you all balance the desire to just start learning by doing, getting it done, with something else you've articulated, which is a sense that there's a bit of a, mic you're under a microscope, you wanna not just do this deal, but show all these constituencies that there's 99 more down the road that they should be doing. How do you get that balance right? Because I suspect in the days where you're just frustrated, you just wanna get started, um, that's maybe every day, but 
So I'll leave it there. And maybe Michael, as someone who's dealing, I know, and, and maybe talk a little about beyond this one deal, what else your firm is working on, and right. are you seeing dynamics that are, are different in other contexts? Right. Well, we're really thinking about this deal as a, again, as a proof of concept to achieve much greater impact at scale. So we want to make sure that this deal is really well done, and that's why we're really putting our heads down and focusing on making sure that this, this deal is right. At the same time, we're still seeing tremendous interest and demand from this from governments. And yes, it's sometimes hard. You find a champion in government who might be really enthusiastic about this, and then they need to work within an institutionalized bureaucracy, which sometimes might be restricting them, right? And, and a lot of, particularly in low and middle income countries, a lot of, um, I know it doesn't seem exciting, but a lot of impact happens through, or impact happens or doesn't happen through procurement. Uh, and procurement in low and middle income countries is oftentimes structured around avoiding corruption for very good reasons, right? That types of rigid procurement systems are part of one of the barriers that prevents us from scaling into other, into other areas. At the same time, we do see governments like the government of Mexico uh, who we've been working with to structure a performance-based contract around diabetes management services, preventing secondary complications associated with diabetes. There are innovative forward-thinking governments that do want to try out these tools and are looking to proof of concepts such as Safina's and Educate Girls and what SIF is doing in order to learn and be able to say, okay, how do we do this, right? There's a really important learning element here that I think in this first deal that CIF and UBS have been really diligent about focusing on, that we're, you know, we're going to document what we're doing, we're going to do a process evaluation, understand what's working, what's not working, because this is ultimately trying to demonstrate something that we want to then replicate in other areas. Yeah, and I think one of the things, and we, we do work in my organization in the U.S., um, and we assume that this is a more efficient way to procure, therefore it will get support. Uh, and I sat down with a mayor's, mayor's office, one of the biggest cities, and, and she said, you know, I just came from my head procurement officer who's been yelling at me for an hour right. about the social impact bond <laughs> because the premise is you all think you're going to be better right. at figuring out how to turn that money into outcomes than we are, but this is what this guy's this, this job is. So, Drew, just turning to you, I mean, you're in an interesting place because you're at the World Bank, but you're also the development marketplace, which in a way was set up to kind of make that case in the World Bank from the beginning, even before you were there, the development marketplace was in some way a challenge to the World Bank bureaucracy to say, <laughs> you aren't sitting in Washington and your country offices finding out everything that needs to be funded. We can do it in a more bottoms-up way, which I think is similar spirit to this. So how do you get the procurement bureaucrats who are your colleagues to embrace <laughs> the idea that not just this is a new way of doing things, but that it, in a way disintermediating them is one of the most exciting things that could be done. It's, again, it's just this challenge of there is no constituency for efficiency. And I think sometimes we make a mistake that a more efficient way of working will inevitably get supporters. Um, but again, a lot of your colleagues would consider themselves to be quite expert at knowing who to fund rather mm -hmm. than letting this sort of system make that decision. Um. Bureaucracies, okay. Um. <laughs> I work at the World Bank, full disclosure, so I say this as someone who's, I'm not in judgment. No, um. The, um, it is an interesting challenge because the development agencies really work best at scale right away. Right. You know, give them a big infrastructure project, it works and resonates very well. Because it resonates with the finance minister of a given country that we work with directly, right? So, I mean, that's our main client is, is a finance minister. So, walking to a finance minister and say, we've got a... Um, a $300,000, $500,000 discussion will be about that long. Um, <laughs> it's over. Um, but so one of the, the key things that's going to have to happen both for my colleagues and for the local governments, one is coming back to some things. There's got to be a level of transparency here. Um, one of the great things that the, you know, uh, the World Bank actually has done over the years and one of the new global practices that we put together is around governance. And governance isn't just about whether there's corruption, but also about it, the subgroups in it are procurement and things like this. So this starts, a product like the social impact bond, development impact bond, weaves in really, really well with the World Bank's recognition that transparency, better procurement procedures are what are going to make governments more efficient. Coming back to your comment about the cost benefits, it gets much clearer as well. You can start really seeing whether the numbers are adding up. So right now, I think all of these things are, start, are going to start coming together and people are going to see the value proposition because most people respond and react to what, what does it do for their job and their ability to perform in their job. So for the World Bank staff, it's really going to be about their ability to go to a, a finance minister and say, long term, if you do this in scale, this is what it can do for you. So the, again, the question will be, and Safina is going to be suffering through this in the carpet bombing description, um, 
where does it go to scale? How does it go to scale? And can you walk back into a government or, and therefore a development agency? Can you do this not with just Educate Girls in Rajasthan, but everybody that's working across India and the X millions of yeah. young girls that are not getting educated or other education factors? And of course, we know that this is highly replicable from what we're already seeing across sectors. Um, you know, carbon financing, tremendous area in the developing countries, which would be a perfect product for using this. So I think we're going to see a real good alignment of that once people understand its ability to scale, the time and costs needed to get there, and whether it's manageable. But if you look at the experience of the UK government, what they've done, they've been you know, in, in, in the US now, everything has really moved towards a hockey stick. You get through those 18, 24 months of pain mm. of doing it, not, not of thinking about it and trying to get people on board. So it's a four-year <laughs> enterprise for Safina. But for the two years of implementation, it's going to move more towards the potential for a hockey stick because other things starts to come together. And if it can make people's lives easier about, wow, you're spending your dollars better, it will start coming together. I think, I think one thing I would say, too, this makes me sound like a tiny rain cloud, but I, I, I swear to God, I am more positive than some of this appears. I think the other thing, and we talked about this before, uh, is I think it highlights some of the gaps in data. And when we start talking about scale on that level, uh, you know, we're talking about right now, we're, we're going to reach a few hundred schools, right? And that's data we can manage. We can, like, lay down that infrastructure. But when we're talking, you know, 40,000 schools, and being relying on that data, and then paying out based on that data. That's, or that's a whole different ball game. And I think one of the things that there, you know, this is able to highlight on a micro scale is where those gaps are in reliable data. And I think that will open up hopefully a whole other discussion, which will be important to have the World Bank on board for, important to have the bilaterals on board for, and to say, you know, if we're going to go down this road, filling in some of these data gaps, supporting the governments to fill in these data gaps is going to be absolutely critical, because otherwise you're not going to get people to pay you know, especially as you get bigger and bigger and bigger. I think so. Uh, can I say something? Two, two things. I mean, one is that means you really have to invest in infrastructure for measurement, Absolutely. Which, which is probably independent of the government. So you need to involve government, but also have, have independently verifiable data uh, and systems for collecting it and synthesizing it and making sense of it. So I think that's a really good point. The other point I was going to make about what's unique about and special about this particular development impact bond is that it's targeting the, the bottom of the pyramid, so-called the poorest people, the most vulnerable. And most social investment vehicles, as far as I understand it, tend to target middle income, low to middle income uh, populations, which is really different. So we're, it's a proof of concept not just for the mechanics, but also for the incredible potential the, uh, of transformation Absolutely. in terms of people who are most vulnerable on, and their lives and futures. So, I think I d that's just a, di uh, a dimension of this bond that we haven't really talked about that I think is is really special and, and important to really? highlight that that this unlocks not only more resources but more resources going to those who need it most. Mm -hmm. And yeah. sorry, if I can just add one more thing to it because you've talked about data and stuff. The other thing it does is that funders are funding education projects right across, right? But you're funding um, a $10,000 intervention for a rural school, or it could be a $500, but this will actually give you almost like a price point. Yeah. To say you bought yeah. an enrollment outcome Absolutely. for, you know, is it $500, $5,000, or whatever, and you can actually compare, compare between those. Right, and um, maybe a learning, learning outcome. outcome. <laughs> right. Learning outcome. <laughs> you know, you, so you'll actually be able to contract different service providers and really be able to compare, because right now you can't compare, right? Uh, it's like apples to oranges. I do gender sensitization. What is the value of that in terms of outcomes versus I do, uh, you know, I don't know, I, I distribute supplies yeah. or I build yeah. infrastructure. But actually then you'll be able to put a price on different outcomes and compare and, and really. And that's where the scale can yeah. come in, the yeah. funding can come in. Uh, with the razor sharp focus on impact for that last girl. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so it's kind so, of fun. <laughs> so we're going to take questions from the audience in a few minutes. Um, just before I get there, I did promise that I would ask a question that may be a little annoying uh, to face. So just to remind you guys, amazing work going on in India. <coughs> the Optimus Foundation, which Faye said, is a foundation of a major bank whose clients are the richest people in the world. <laughs> I didn't going say to, that. Well, but they I are. Mean... <laughs> um, who certainly have more money than any of us and... I'll leave it at that. <laughs> so they are going to give money to Safina's organization. If she achieves the outputs, the foundation created in London that 
state works for is going to pay the investors back with a financial return. They're going to make a profit. So around here, we might all take for granted that investors are a morally legitimate and economically effective force for good in the world. I don't know, go 100 meters in any direction, and people are going to think that's ridiculous. So I posed the question I said to you was, if this works, you are going to take money out of your foundation and give financial return, not just returning the money, but profits to some of the richest people in the world. How does your foundation get comfortable with that? And maybe it's because of where you guys come from specifically. <laughs> but that's a big part of what we're talking about here. And I just want a quick answer, and then we'll take questions. So I, th I think that's a really great question. Um, I guess the, sh the short answer is that we feel that our values align with those of the Optimist Foundation and what they're trying to achieve and the way they're trying to achieve it. And we trust them. Um, I think the, the medium-term answer is that it's a means to an end. So as you know, we've all said here, my goal would be that some way down the line, the Rajasthan government is the outcome payer here and, um, and that they would be understanding you know, what they're buying, what the price point is, that they'd be able to go to a market and say, we're going to buy you know, learning outcomes for girls, we can compare, that kind of thing. And I think if, you know, if there's an investor return in the, you know, to that, that seems like a pretty good buy from where I stand. And as I said, the privilege of being philanthropy is that we can take that risk. Um, but, I, but I do think our starting point is that, you know, we trust the Optimist Foundation. I think we believe in their values and what they're trying to do, and we feel aligned to them. Does this come up for you or your board, um, Safina? Um, what? This, sort of this question of why do we want to get in bed with investors, and they can't possibly have the good intentions we have. Uh, the investor, by the way, is still giving me a grant. Okay. So I can't actually, as a nonprofit in yeah. India, I can't accept investment. So it is still structured to me as a grant, so my board's not ready. My board's very committed to this because they know that we're going to go to 30,000 schools, we're going to go to 4.5 million children, and this will be the way to sort of unlock the capital that we will require. But like she said, it's everything that we're all doing is just see it as creating the template. Mm -hmm. Template that others will just take and run with, essentially, right? And everybody's investment and commitment and passion is for that and to see if that template works. So in the short term, if they're paying them an interest or blah, 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 it, I kind of feel like it's a little immaterial. The thing is, India's got the CSR rule now, 2% of all corporate mm -hmm. money is going. They would be the natural investors. So right, there's just right. so much that you could do and play with. Uh, that's an important journey to take. I also think... I also, yeah, oh, sorry. I, I was just going to say, Faye, I think, the, I think the other thing is that part of Optimus's model also is that those financial returns have the option of being put back into yeah. the foundation. Yeah. So that's not always, that doesn't mean that necessarily those donors are going to, the investors are going to get that money back. They can put yeah. it back in. So right? I was going to say two things on that. One is I'm going to take my optimist hat off for a moment. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not going to say this with the optimist hat on, but so with just the Faye Twersky hat on, I'll say that a lot of resources in philanthropy have been wasted. So if there's a way, right. so you, right. <laughs> uh, you can tweet that on the Faye Twersky hat. But, uh, so, so, uh, if there's a way to make philanthropic resources be smarter, better, have greater impact, great. Yeah. So that's the, I mean, that's the, that's the direct answer. Uh, but the other thing, from putting my optimist hat back on, uh, Faith is exactly right. So one of the things we're considering, well, we haven't made a decision, uh, is creating a recycled uh, development impact bond fund that people can contribute to, the, 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 the returns come back into it, but then get exactly. reused and recycled, so that it's actually a very efficient way to bring more resources in and keep them in. Yeah. And I just really want to quickly touch on this, because we work with a lot of different governments who raise a lot of these questions. At the end of the day, this has to be about cost effectiveness, about greater value for money, more effective public spending, more bang for the buck. Yeah. Ultimately, it's not as much about the Optimist Foundation or the investor, it's about how much bang am I getting for the buck? And the ability of the government to be able to transfer away that performance risk and only be paying for results. That provides tremendous value, and it's that value which is being catalyzed by the investor. But ultimately, the investor is, is just, again, a means to an end to more effective, cost-effective programs. Great. Thanks so much. So we only have a few minutes left. I saw there were some enthusiastic questions in the audience. So I <laughs> ask you to stand up. Say who you are, where you're from, and then pose a question either to a panelist or to all of us. Um, and if you are posing your question in the form of a three-minute speech, I'll cut you off. <laughs> so um, one, two, three. And I'll, we'll take all three just for efficiency, um, and then the, the panelists will figure it out. So go ahead. As, as you do ladies first. Oh, sorry. No. <laughs> Stand up. Hi, I'm Emma Tomkinson. Um, 
My question for you is you keep talking about a proof of concept, but what is the concept you're trying to prove? Is it about the service? Is it about the separation of outcomes payer and investor? Um, so, so what's the point of difference here that, that you're going to emphasise and sort of sell on? Yeah, that's a great question. Mm. Thank you, Emma. My name's Andrew. I'm with Escalera. We're some doers trying to do a paper success in southern Mexico, so we admire you. Congratulations. Uh, one of our bottlenecks is, is the outcome pair. And so my question is directed at Faith. You brought up this concern about we understand you want to prove the concept. What, what advice would you have to other foundations or grant makers that are trying to consider making an outcome payment commitment for this transitionary purpose, but also in the long term? What's, what's your advice to them about doing this? Or what is your advice to a service provider like ourselves in approaching foundations uh, looking, that might be interested in doing the same thing. Great, thanks. And then last question in the back. Hi, I'm Jay Jablonel. I'm curious, um, we uh, work at an impact investment group, and I'm curious, we can be either a payor or a seeder. So it would be curious for me to hear, well, I don't want to compromise any of the terms of your deal, but it's very interesting for me to think about since there's, it's a proof of concept, what you're actually using as numbers for expected return or profit that you would allow as a seeder or criteria for when you get your money back. Right. So, so, okay, so thanks so much. So three questions. So Emma was a great question. You all talk about proving the concept. What is the concept? Is it financial innovation? Is it evidence-based policy? I mean, there's lots of things we've been throwing around. Um, second question from Andrew, how would you approach a foundation trying to get them to perhaps change how they've always done things. And, and then I think your question um, about, the, you know, specifically, what are we talking about? I'd say maybe this deal, I know the deal hasn't been struck, uh, and there's a Swiss banker involved, so we want to be super discreet. Um, <laughs> so I'm not sure that the panelists can share the details, but maybe um, some of you who are aware of some of the general terms that are out there or what the, the boundaries of that conversation have been, that would be helpful. So I leave it to you guys to take any one of those in any order. In, ter in terms of success, uh, to address Andrew's question, uh, success can be measured along a number of different dimensions. We're looking, actually, each party comes to the table with a very different def definition of success. So uh, UBS, Optimist Foundation, is very much interested, in, as, as Faye was mentioning, about creating an investable asset for the bottom of the pyramid. Right? Faith is very interested about demonstrating this model uh, to be able to replicate in, uh, in, other, in, other, in other areas. And Educate Girls is, of course, interested in improving their impact. So it's that, but, but even though we each have a different definition of success, it's the alignment or, of interests that is really what brings us together around more effective, uh, more effective programs and more performance-driven uh, service providers like Educate Girls. And I'll, I'll push a little on that. I don't know yeah. if it's as much alignment um, in the sense that I think it's just like any capital markets deal when you have different parties coming to the table. They're all coming from different motivations right. and different organizational priorities. And they have to stick with that. They're not going to change per se. So it's not like everybody's going to sit there at the end of the day and put, put Safina on their shoulders and say, we have succeeded. It will be, <laughs> it will be <laughs> I have figured out a way to leverage foundation dollars. Right. I have figured out a way to implement a transaction in an efficient cost present. I've had a chance to reach girls in a way that no one else has. And so, and so actually, the, there's a healthy dynamic here happening of friction, right. of each trying to push to slightly different parts of it. And like any capital markets deal, it gets done when everybody gets what they need out of it. And what we're getting is transparency. We're getting better documentation outcomes. We're getting better outcomes for girls, and so on. So it is all of this friction coming together, my perspective. So it's a little less alignment and healthy friction to get to <laughs> something that everybody can live for for their slightly different mandates. That's a good way to put it. Can, if, uh, was there, do, do you think there's another way to put it? Like in what your question was that the proof of concept is how you can tie money to final outcome. Hmm. Right. right. For me, it's like how do, you, do, how do I make outcome-based budgets? How do I do outcome-based performance management? How, so uh, for them, it's, you know, what is the price point that you're buying it on, or what's the return that you should get for whatever and stuff? But it's really about those two pieces, as far as I'm concerned: is how much is the money and what's the. <laughs> yeah. So we're not going to be able to compete with this beautiful bird for attention. Um, but just quickly, any thoughts on the question of how would you approach a foundation trying to get them to participate in a different way? Maybe you want to take that one. Sure. Yeah. So I think that's a great question, Andrew. Um, without being too discouraging, I think. <laughs> 
my rain cloud here. Um, it's, it's, it's a tough early days right now. I mean, I think one of, one of the issues is that uh, smaller organizations, smaller foundations are just going to have very different budget cycles. Like putting something, it, it, we are lucky to be able to say we can put this money aside for three years because we don't have to spend down. And that's also one of the things, the UK doesn't have the 5% uh, spend requirement that the US foundations do. So, you know, that's a pretty t particularly kind of privileged position that we're in. So I think, um, and especially when you start talking bigger and bigger, um, I think that what I would recommend to you is to look for as much thought partnership as you can and get the deal as close to done as you can. I think one thing that we haven't just, you know, I sort of alluded to, this has been a lot of work and we have a lot of in-house expertise. We have in-house legal counsel. I have in-house M&E people. You know, the, I have all these resources I can draw on and this is like a quarter of my time. And if you're a smaller foundation, you just don't have that kind of resourcing to, to make those decisions. So I think one thing that I would say is that if you're looking for an outcome payer, you want to come to them with an intermediary and an investor as close to done on that and say, here's what you're buying. This is what we're asking you to buy. Um, and, and maybe expect less in terms of that thought partnership from an outcome payer. I, that, that would be, I think, Great. where I was So going. I know we have to run. Um, I'm just going to ask for your indulgence for a few minutes. So I think most of the panelists can stay. If you have specific questions, come up and ask them. But if a lightning round, I'm going to give you each 30 seconds. Um, what is the question you wish you had been asked? And either answer it or ask it of another panelist. Okay, I had this one ready though, so I'm checking. <laughs> um, I wish that somebody had asked, I think how do we know if this isn't working? Mm -hmm. That to me is what I'm still not clear on, is that you know, we're talking about whole, there's a whole range of instruments out there. You know, we talked today about the DIB is one of them, just giving a unrestricted funding with some money for impact evaluation is another way to do this. Like there, there's a whole range. So at what point are we gonna say this nascent market isn't working? This is, this is not worth it. The transaction costs are too high. You know, and I think that to, for me is I still haven't found out what that cutoff point is yet. So I think that, that's something that I think is a good question that we should all be asking ourselves and try to be open and honest, <laughs> honest about. And also to add on that, where is this more likely to work or where this is less likely to work? Exactly, absolutely. There are a lot of different ideas floating around of development impact bonds in a lot of different areas. Our priors about where it's gonna work, and we, we, we have a theory of the way the world works and where, I mean, it's important to have that theory, I should say. I don't think that it's necessarily given that everyone does have that theory about how it is that a development impact bond is gonna actually change the way that services are delivered. And we really wanna be focused on, on because, because we're not gonna have a lot of time to be able to test a thousand different areas and a thousand different providers, right? We wanna be focused about where are the areas that we believe that it's most likely to work, how is it going to work, and test in those areas to be able to learn as fast as we can right. um, and be able to produce some evidence that, that this is working better or maybe this isn't working better and we need to uh, pivot and try a different approach. And, right. and this, again, it's an experiment and we need to be open to that. Right. I wish uh, that somebody had asked about uh, do we, there are many areas that need philanthropic attention that can't be measured in the precise ways that we're proposing to with this development impact bond. But do we think that the, the development impact bond experience will help unleash the generous impulses of our ultra high net worth citizens of the globe so that they will not just be generous as investors but also generous and even maybe more generous as philanthropic givers. Thanks. Thanks. So, Good question. quickly, last word from the two of you guys. I see other people are coming in. Yeah. So the, the one that, um, and I alluded a little bit to it earlier, is, is the question, where is the local government? If this is such a yeah. great idea, and this is their population we're working with, why are they not right here at the table saying, we're behind each of these? Thanks. That's a great question. And last word, Safina, from you. I, I don't have. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, you have a lot of work to do when you get back to implement this. So <laughs> with that. So I'd like to thank the panel, and I thank you guys all for joining us, and it's great to be able to learn while doing it.